Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethyst Deharic. Your host is for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers to a Gender Identity Today. If you are already a subscriber, thank you. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as all the other content, by me and our other contributors, please consider subscribing using links that you're going to find in the show notes. So today, I am sitting here with Katie Corradino. First of all, thank you, Katie, for coming in and showing up. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be talking with you, Emmy. Wait until the end of the show and, and you know... At the end of it, I'll ask you again, and, and uh, you know, if it really was a good time, you know, then if it wasn't, I'll cut out that piece, you know, <laughs> so that people don't get to the end and go, God, she probably wasn't too enthusiastic about that. I so, can't imagine that will happen, God. <laughs> I have no idea. So I know Katie. Katie, I know you through, um, through Dreamers and Doers, so this is a network to which both Katie and I belong, but I was... Um, I was struck by Katie's background because, so Katie is, um, first of all, has the website Full Soul Nutrition and also the hostess of the podcast Whole, Full, and Alive. I'm interested in you, Katie, because, you know, I talk about um, identity, and as I mentioned to you, I believe identity is this complex of our physical structure, our emotional, you know, all the drives and motivations we have, and all of this gets expressed within a social environment. And what I know you do, you are a registered dietitian who works with people in particular with, with uh, their body image. So I wanna just stop there and let you talk for a moment. Um, can you tell me just first of all, you know, everything you do and why you do it? I think it's the why you do it that I'm curious about. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's the why that's always more important and meaningful as well. I feel like I love that lecture from Simon Sinek when he says people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Um, yeah. And I just, I always try to keep that in mind because it's not only like a sales tactic, it's true. Um, and so... Here's, here's what, just to get it out of the way. I am a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I'm also a yoga teacher and dance instructor and Reiki healer and breathwork facilitator and body image expert and retreat host. And I love to integrate everything that I do into one service. So I provide holistic and tangible nutrition counseling for people while also providing them with a toolkit of somatic healing modalities that really helps them heal their relationship with food and their relationship with their bodies. And why I do what I do is because there are so many people whose personal power and potential is stunted by their relationship with food and their relationship with their sure. body. Oh yeah. There's so many people who feel like so much of their headspace and so much of their brain space is taken up by food and their body shape or size. And right. this has been passed down for generations. And I feel truly committed to helping be a part of the end to that generational cycle of people restricting food binging food, restricting food, binging food, and that cycle of people who are so fixated on their body shape and size that they forget that who they are is so much more than that and isn't even that right. at all. Yeah. Right. Now, I believe in your background actually is some struggle with, with yes. body image, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you don't and have to so talk about it if you don't want to. No, I I have my own podcast. I, it's it's out there. All this information. So, I another reason why I do what I do is because I do feel deeply and per, like personally connected to this mission as well. I was diagnosed with a clinical eating disorder when I was 15 years old. Um, oh, and, 15. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And I was in eating disorder treatment for about five years, and then I was deemed like recovered by the time I was 
19, 20 years old, but I wasn't really recovered. I hadn't really done any of the deeper work that was necessary for me to have a truly positive and sustainable, healthy relationship right. with food and body image. I was just like, I was functional. I was functional. And I think that what my story, which is not a unique one, illustrates is that people think disorder eating is all about whether or not you're underweight or overweight. And that's mm -hmm. not what this is about at all. I was weight restored by the time I was 17 years old, air quotes, weight restored, right? It's a very arbitrary term. However, I still had so much more healing to do. Um, I still felt so attached to controlling my food intake and a fixation on my body size. And I wasn't fully recovered until a decade after I was diagnosed. And I feel really called to make sure that there aren't other young women who are trapped in the place I was, which was like pure confusion of like, people are telling me I'm recovered, but I still feel like shit. People are telling right. me I'm recovered, but I still don't know how to feed myself. And I still am obsessed with looking in the mirror. And, um, that's just so normalized in our world. Disordered behaviors are so normalized yes. too. So it's like a lot of people will say, Oh, that's just normal though. That's just how, that's just how women are. That's just how people are. That's just what it's like when you're a dancer, which I was. And, um, we really need to undo that expectation. Oh, I agree completely. What did they consider was recovered? They just, I mean, you mentioned body weight. That yeah. was it? Yeah, and it was like this idea of, well, she's eating, so she must be fine. Okay. And that's another sure. misconception as well, which is that like, mm -hmm. if someone is eating, that does not mean that they have a healthy relationship with food. Um, right. First of all, you don't know what's happening behind closed doors, right? You might see someone eat what would be considered a nourishing meal in front of you and behind closed doors. It's a totally different story and we don't follow someone around and watch them eat all day. And also, right. even if someone is eating technically three nourishing meals in a day, they might still be thinking about food all day. They might still be thinking about their body all day. Um, we don't know what's going on with someone internally. Um, and we don't know what their fears are and we don't know what drives their decisions on a daily basis. And so it is really important to look at this in a much more holistic way. Yes. You know, though, um, cause I think the holistic way also kind of has, it has to include social environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause I, so I grew up in the, uh, I grew up the, you know, as a teenager in the 1980s in, Los Angeles. So like, you know, it was just starting to like the Valley girl cult culture was mm -hmm. sort of just kicking in, but then there was all the beach, you know, all the beach stuff, all the surfers, all the, you know, the Barbie looking people. Damn, I didn't mean to dump on Barbie cause you know, I love the, uh, I love the movie, but you know, the, the, um, you know, sort of a Barbie looking culture and you know, the, the social, the pressure, the expectations were ridiculous on, cause I have, you know, I have three sisters and all three of them felt this pressure, you know, it didn't come from, it didn't come from necessarily within, it came from, you know, from, from without. So, I mean, do you have, do you have thoughts on that? I mean, do, does some of our, our unhealthy relationship with food, is it a response to our social environment? Yeah, so much of it is a response to our social environment. So much of it is the very unfortunate normalization of disordered behaviors, very unfortunate normalization of a chaotic relationship with your body, very unfortunate normalization of like looking in the mirror and just being like, oh, I got to work on my arms. I got to do this. Blah, blah, blah. And so this, so much of this is a learned behavior and a learned way of thinking and some of it is a trauma response as well. It's an attempt to regulate. If you are someone who has had, I mean, I don't want to say someone who has had trauma. It sounds so general, but it, it often is a trauma response, an attempt to regulate when you're feeling dysregulated, controlling sure. your body shape or size or self-soothing with food. Like sometimes disordered eating and obsession with body shape and size is truly a survival mechanism when someone's feeling like their survival's threatened. Yeah. I just actually didn't consider that, but yeah, a response to trauma makes 
perfect sense. I mean, yeah, because I, you know, I like you. I certainly have struggled, um, you know, with with my well, struggle with my relationship with food. Mm-hmm. I've always been, you know, I was. Well, so I was always kind of overweight, and then I got to graduate school, and I discovered I could buy ephedrine, you know, mm. at the local um, um, gas station, the corner gas station. Mm. And so ephedrine became what I ate, and then I was super-duper thinned until people went, mm. you know, that doesn't, you okay? Mm. So, but, um, you know, I like all of that, though, was... So, so you, we did mention some of what came from without, so trauma responses. But that mm-hmm. being said, I guess some of it also comes from within. I mean, mm-hmm. there is, I would almost go with the trauma response is, is coming from within because the social environment impacted us. And then we go, well, here's how we, you know, here, here is how we end up trying to control it, like you said. So, um, you do other, you, you have other aspects of what you do. I mean, nutrition is a big thing. I, I, it's amazing to me how, like, how little people understand about nutrition. Um, mm. I don't know if yeah. you want to have a quick. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, t- yeah. I took, like, you know, biochemistry courses as, a, as uh-huh. an undergraduate, which is great. But, you know, like the normal person goes, you know, we, we see things in, in like, it's like little volumetric flasks of something, right? They're like, well, you need yeah. vitamin A, so here's vitamin A. And there's, oh, you need mm. vitamin D, here's vitamin D. And then you need this thing, whatever it is, a coenzyme Q, you know. Yeah. But we don't think of it as, can we just eat food that, it, that nourishes us? Yeah. Um, so I, I asked like three different questions there. Let me stop for a moment. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think I I feel like I have a bit of a response to a a few of the different things that you mentioned, like the trauma response being coming from within. I just want to speak to that for a moment because you might be familiar with this concept of like the body keeps the score, right? So when we have a, a traumatic experience, our body experiences it and our body stores that experience our body remembers that experience without our brain remembering that experience our body can remember that experience which is can feel really scary and so oftentimes disordered eating and objectification of the body intellectualizing the body rather than being in it is an attempt to not feel it's an attempt to disconnect from whatever our body is storing and whatever Mm -hmm. score our body is keeping and so sometimes it's like we need to view it as like an intelligent response. It's like, wow, that makes a lot of sense that you tried to disembody it. This is not working anymore. This is definitely becoming a unhealthy, life-threatening condition. And also let's honor the fact that there was some sort of intelligent response of your body like that stored trauma and you attempted to disconnect so that you didn't have to experience that. And I think just like giving people the grace of knowing that this isn't your fault, it kind of makes sense that this happened and then you have the external cultural norms of disordered eating on top of that attempt to regulate and it's just the perfect storm and so that's one thing that i wanted to respond to first um i I think the the objectification though i think that plays i think that plays into what what i'm talking about because i think a lot of modern Mm -hmm medicine a lot of science is based on this idea that the body is a machine Mm -hmm. and we can just kind of you know so long as you change the oil every three months every five thousand miles or something like that like your body is going to be okay we don't consider the idea that every body and every soul in the body is different that each of us is unique we don't really consider that so but i think that played into what i was saying before that you know we look at this as well here's a pill you know, you just need this one thing. And it's like, no, mm-hmm. you need nutrition is what you need, not yeah. nutrients. Mm. I, I love sense? that. I, that I love that perspective. And, and yeah, I, um, I actually kind of want to share this somewhat funny story. When I first started okay. studying nutrition, I was saying to my dad, I was like, dad, you're not 
eating enough. Like this is not an adequate breakfast. Like you need carbs, proteins, and fats. Like where are your vitamins? Like, and he was like, Oh, I eat vitamins. I was like, you do. He's like, yeah, I, I, I know I make sure I get enough magnesium, enough vitamin C. And I was like, what, what, what are you eating that has magnesium yeah. or vitamin C in it? All I'm seeing is it's a piece of bread. And he's like, come with me. And he walks me to his bathroom and opens up his medicine cabinet. And he has all these bottles of like magnesium vitamin C, vitamin D, just like all compartmentalized. And I remember mm -hmm. looking at that and thinking, oh, wow, people really think that this is how you get your needs met. And they don't yes. see food as, as nourishment. You're right. They see it as like compartmentalized nutrients. Like we are machines. Right. And yeah, um, food, first of all, is a, a psychological and emotional need, right? So like your body's not psychologically and emotionally nurtured through bottles of vitamin C. Um, yeah. and you want to chew things. You want to savor the taste of things. Mm -hmm. You need to experience flavors. And this is a part of your culture and your traditions and connections and socialization. And also our body needs macronutrients. Our body needs yes. carbs, proteins, right. and fats, not just the micronutrients. And right. yeah, that's really misunderstood. <laughs> and some of, some of those have sort of synergistic effects so like yeah. you, you know you eat a let's say it's broccoli let's go with broccoli because broccoli has a lot of vitamin c and i think vitamin a i yeah. don't know fact just somebody can fact check me because <laughs> because you know i make stuff up all the time but you know you eat some broccoli it's different from eating you know the two pills like you said let's say you take yeah. a vitamin a and a vitamin c pill it's very mm -hmm. different because the broccoli has stuff we may not even have identified that we look mm. at and we just go, I don't know, it's some crap in the broccoli. Mm. But broccoli makes me, you know, I love broccoli. I've always loved broccoli. I know George Bush had that big deal, you know. I hate broccoli, but anyway, thanks, George. Oh, he's passed on, sorry. I'll move on. Any fans of George Bush out there, which are probably few, sorry. So, what the hell was I talking about? Broccoli. So, you know, there's more stuff in the broccoli than just, you know, it's, it's micronutrients, as you say. And there are things we don't, like, we don't even know the synergistic effects because hum the human body is so mi well misunderstood, I think I would say. So, but, but you find this as a common, in your practice, you've got to find this is very common. The people go, well, I just got a bottle. Isn't this, isn't this enough? Yeah, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. And I actually really appreciate this like biochemical perspective that you're bringing to the conversation oh. because it's so true that broccoli contains things that we don't even know about yet. Like nutrition is understood in a foundational sense. We know that we need the three macronutrients to create energy. We know that we need fiber. We know that we need certain vitamins and minerals to promote our immune system, our metabolism, our hair, skin, and nail growth, right? We've got these very foundational building blocks of nutrition that like just started to be understood in like my grandparents' lifetime. And yeah. we still have so much further to go. And it's very scary when people feel very matter of fact about these like very rigid mm -hmm. diet plans that like Gwyneth Paltrow created. And it's like, do you understand like how much more research we still need to do? Like we've got to focus on these foundational building blocks and not get caught up in the minutia because we're still understanding the minutia anyone who speaks about the nutritional minutia with any sort of matter of factness is often mm -hmm. trying to sell you something and yes people who are feeling dysregulated in their relationship with food and body are so um vulnerable to that yeah false yeah. info yeah because i mean i think it i think that it's a uh yeah, speaking of synergistic uh your relationship i mean it's a ver uh a vicious cycle, you know, the more that we, I don't want to use the word pretend, the more, mm -hmm. the more understanding we believe we have of the human body and the more that we reduce it, you know, the more mm -hmm. reductionist we get with our understanding of biology, I think that contributes to this idea that, we, well, you know, you can take a pill, but then furthermore, you can get into the binge and purge cycles that mm -hmm. I know you and I had talked about previously too. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is mm -hmm. a pretty, you know, significant, there's, there's a lot of, there's a big psychological component to that as well, to the binge and purge cycle. But I think that when we, when we consider a body just as a, just as a machine, which by the way, your hair is beautiful. 
Oh. We just want to take that <laughs> Thank quick you. moment. It was, it was pulling. I was like, I have to take it down. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. Thank Look you. at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I think I think it is this reductionist approach that we take to to new, to biology, really, to biochemistry, mm -hmm. that um, that contributes to this. I think it helps, or contributes to it because it hurts. Mm -hmm. But because the question I wanted to ask you. You mentioned that these are things that, that were really only being starting to be understood in your grandparents' you know, mm -hmm. lifetime. Yeah. Is this more of a new problem, this idea of you know, this horrible relationship with food? Mm. You know, no, um, because a lot of the social issues that keep people obsessed with their body shape and size are certainly not new. Mm -hmm. Um, and also the way in which food can be a soothing tool to a, a harmful and excessive extent is also not new because our, the animal of True. our bodies was always soothed by food. I think that right. it's a very newly understood problem, though. I think that really there's been so much progress in my lifetime on understanding eating disorders and acknowledging that this is a really big endemic that we need to figure yeah. out. So like, I think that it's not new, um, but it's newly understood and certainly underreported and it's underreported, um, honestly across the, the gender spectrum. I think that a lot of people see eating disorders as a, a women's identifying issue and it's right. simply not, it's simply not, um, men and women, men and women and people of all gender identities experience disordered eating. And it's, I, I personally believe it's equivalent. I think we have enough information to kind of say it's equivalent emerging, but a lot of people say it's disproportionately affecting women, but I just don't think that that's true. That's, that's a tad bit though. <laughs> no, no, no. You know what though? Cause I, I, you know, cause ultimately you knew I was going to talk about gender. Presumably yeah. you knew that, but yeah. cause you know, gender, at least to me, you know, in, in, in the work that I've done, gender is this relationship between, I mean, I'm calling it a negotiation between the mm. person we know we are and the person we feel safe expressing within our social environment. And sometimes mm. the person we, we feel safe is, is somebody with a horrible relationship with food. I mean, mm. I, it's interesting to me, you know, I've read several stories and I've, I've wanted to understand, you know, the people who will become obese to the point of, of harming themselves, it's a defense, mechan a defense mechanism because it seems hard. It seems hard to believe. I don't understand the mindset, and I don't want to mm -hmm. diminish it. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess where I was going to go, as far as gender is concerned, though, this negotiation. Oh, and, and I guess I should probably mention as well. I don't think gender is something that only women have to deal with, or only transgender people have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Gender yeah. is a major aspect of identity. Like period. Yeah. And so what that means is that, um, like everybody deals with it, you know, are, are the, you know, the president deals mm -hmm. with it, you know, your mom dealt with it, your dad dealt with it, you know, you're dealing with it. Whether or not it's a problem to you is really, that's the question. Whether or not mm -hmm. is, whether or not you, you acknowledge that, um, that, that you attempting to express yourself is, is, uh, is really, that's the point. So mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't end that sentence very well, but I'm going to stop. Because I want it, because I want, you know, I agree with you that, that eating disorders is targeted typically toward women. Mm -hmm. So like, tell me at least, at least a little bit, because I mean, in your own practice, do you see a lot of men coming in or is it difficult for, to, for them to admit it, I guess is the word I want to use? Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I just, I feel like I just learned a lot from you in what you just shared. Thank so you. thank you. Thank you. I, I am always really looking to learn more about my own, about gender and understand gender, sure. um, more comprehensively and understand more people's perspectives on gender and their experience of gender. And so I appreciate everything that you just shared. Um, sure. and yeah, I do have an equal number of men actually now, um, on my caseload okay. to women. 
And what I'm finding though, is that men are either coming to me later in life. Um, I've had this interesting and, and quite heartwarming trend of dads coming to me. Um, after their daughters recovered from eating disorders and they, this happened a few times now that, a a man who's a father will come to me and say, I found you on the intuitive eating directory. This is a, a framework of counseling that I practice. Um, and I, I would love to work with you because I, my daughter's relationship with food was really chaotic and I know I played a part in that and I kind of want to learn more about this. And I, I, it's been oh a miracle gosh. just to, to hear from those men, honestly, and work with them has been so great because at first I was like, I'm not working with men. Um, and I have changed my mind about that completely. And right. another subset of men that approach me are men who are referred to me by their psychiatrist or another doctor. Um, and that is also another... Um, another avenue through which it becomes easier for them to seek support. I don't think it's very common that a man is going to find me on Instagram and be like, Oh, this is an interesting thing. Like I should work on this. Cause it's just, first of all, the algorithm. Um, but second of all, I just don't think that that's Good as point. easy with social constructs. They're not taught to, to seek support in this stuff. And right. there is much more normalization and, and also celebration of dieting and men. I see my brothers struggling with like the, Um, pressure to do intermittent fasting as if that's not an eating disorder. Um, Mm. Meanwhile, women are starting to have more conversations, generally, not all of them, about like, oh, intermittent fasting kind of doesn't really make sense. Like, that's kind of disordered. That's kind of rigid. But whereas men speak about stuff like this, like, oh, yeah, whatever, Joe Rogan's doing it and whatever, you know, not to bring George Bush and Joe Rogan onto this podcast too much, but like, you know what I'm saying? I think, I, I think I there's definitely I a different the conversation. Not to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, cause I use the word, I mean, I want to hear, first of all, I want to hear about intermittent fasting. Cause I, cause that's something that I actually just started researching. Cause I was like, mm. what, what is this about that? Yeah. Um, because I use the word admit it, or I guess the phrase, that, that you know, men, men have less of a, I don't know, if I want to call it a capacity, less of a capacity to admit to problems. But that ends up being a, a gender expression as well. It's something society goes, well, you know, you're not supposed to be weak as a man, you know. So, so certainly you don't have any, not only do you don't have any eating disorders, you also don't have any problems with rage. You don't have any problems with, you know, all of your relationships, <laughs> you know. So you're totally normal being the dick you are. And some of you out there are dicks, okay? Um, so tell me more about intermittent fasting, because why, why is that bad? Yeah. Oh my gosh, though, I do want to comment that again, that is such an interesting way of framing it, of that it is a gender expression to not admit their challenges. Um, and it is a gender Absolutely. expression to, yeah. yeah, wow, yeah. I mean, I've never used that... Um, that conceptualization to to label that phenomenon but that makes a lot of sense um intermittent fasting let me tell you I, so i have a little bit of an elevator pitch on it because i get a lot of questions about it from clients and essentially sure. i like to give people the benefit of the doubt and also practice as much compassion as possible by saying that I think intermittent fasting started with decent intentions, meaning there were a lot of people that were eating in the middle of the night. And there are a lot of people who were eating big meals really, really late at night when the body should be asleep. Right. Sure. And so basically I think intermittent fasting kind of started from a place of like, Hey, Maybe you should eat your dinner and then go to sleep and not, you know, stay up all night and eat all night because our bodies are designed to have about 12 hours of sleep. But I know that's a lot for what most of us are able to get in our society today. But just like, you know, biologically, our, the animal of our body kind of evolved to have this sort of like 12 hour rest period, reset period so, when not so only tw- are so we 12 not- hours. But 12 hours yeah. a night? Because I mean, like, no. I 12 hours a week I pull off, but 12, so yeah, 12 no, no. hours a night. I don't, I don't mean to get in the weeds of, like, num- amount of sleep. I just mean, like, <laughs> no, generally speaking from, like, 
eight to eight, our body is like yeah. good to be yeah. like resting and not only not eating, but just also like not exercising and not speaking to other right. people. And like, you know, um, and so I'm like, okay, if you want to eat dinner around seven and then don't eat and not eat breakfast until you know, seven or eight, seven. that's good. Yeah. But that's all the intermittent fasting you need. I think people have taken that window of reset that the body needs and they've just like extended it so much to a harmful yeah. extent. It's like people are doing these like 18 hour fast, this 20 hour fast, this 22 right. hour and, and eating all their food in a small window, which metabolically doesn't make any sense. And oh, really okay. causing a, a disrupted regulation, a disrupted relationship with food. And also it's causing people to like have this sense of like rules and rigidity around food rather than letting themselves be a bit more intuitive and kind of honoring their body as it's speaking to them gotcha. about when it wants breakfast, when it wants lunch, when it wants dinner. It's like, nope, okay. got to eat in my window. And so I really believe that, yes, it's important that your body gets a period of reset of sleep. And I'm not talking about not eating. I'm talking about also resting and sleeping and not exercising sure. and not watching TV. And so, um, when we place the emphasis on like, we've got to restrict eating in that window, then we forget like, Oh, our body's actually designed to have this reset. And this reset isn't about restricting food. It's about having a, a reset from, from night to the next morning. And so I just think people have taken that window and like stretched it out and made it only about food. Is that making sense? It, it does. And I got to tell you, that's not, I didn't think about that. See, I think of, yeah. oh gosh, that's, that's spurred so many thoughts. Because I think mm. of an eating disorder, I think of an eating disorder, oh, gosh, I'm going to look so ignorant. You're, you're saying that the, that the important part is the, re the rules, really, that it becomes rules and, and regulations on eating. Do, am I saying that? Is that an inadequate summary? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really important piece of having a good relationship with food is not putting these like rigid rules. And, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I, so I did, I had never considered that. I can mm. like the, the binge and purge thing I, I always thought was, yeah. cause I've, I've done this, but I've mm -hmm. always thought it was, it was really, you know, it ends up being a, I think of it as a punishment to myself that, mm. that you either eat food or you don't. Or, mm. or you know, purge it out um, as, as more as a punishment. But the idea of there just that any rule, any restriction, other than that, so as not to honor what your body wants, yes. as you've put it, yeah. I never considered that that would be disordered eating. So mm. intermittent fasting made sense because I've fasted, you know, for for yeah. long periods before. And your body does get the chance to reset, you know, to do yeah. some amazing healing. Um, mm -hmm. But I see what you're saying. I had not considered yeah. that, that, like this 18 hour thing, you're sitting there going, I got 20 more minutes until I can eat breakfast. Yeah. And it's like, just eat, but if you're hungry, eat breakfast. Yeah. But stunning, right. that was an insight I didn't have. Mm. Um, so yes, it did make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think, of course. um, of course, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are spiritual practices that involve fasting for certain spiritual holidays in certain cultures. And that gets sticky. Certainly. I, I do work with a lot of clients who come from certain cultures and traditions in which they are asked to fast at a certain time of the year. And, right. you know, it's important for them to prioritize their recovery and it is important for them to kind of reframe their spiritual practices in a way that's going to allow them to do what they need to do for themselves while still maintaining a relationship with the sense of spirituality and also ideally someone who's doing those fasting practices has a good relationship with their sense of spirituality and feels like it is truly for the spiritual practice and it's not going to disrupt their relationship with food when that period is over so that is one piece that is important to acknowledge and then also coming back to what you said about rules 
being a restriction in and of themselves. Yes, there are so many people who binge because they've set so many rules on themselves, not just because they've literally restricted physical food like they haven't eaten, it's that they are setting so many rules about no added sugar, um, no carbs, no fat, no this, no that, to the point that one, they get physiologically hungry um, sure. and binge. And two, they become psychologically and emotionally deprived, and that causes this yes. like last supper mentality every single time they eat. Um, and just a really fractured relationship with food and shame and a sense of mental health that isn't right. working. And beyond right. the, the rebound binging, it's also like, how do you feel? Like, it just doesn't feel good to be following all yeah. these rules and regulations. Like, that's the bottom line. Yeah, yeah. That, that comment about the uh, the Last Supper mentality, I think that's that feels very spot on there. That's that's yeah. uh, probably a little uncomfortable for some people, I think, to to consider that. But yeah, that's that's uh, um, you know what though, because I want to let's switch gears just a tiny bit because we've started mm -hmm. dancing around the idea of spirituality, but we've talked a lot about the physicality, so the you know the 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 mm -hmm. um, physical aspect of our bodies, um, mm -hmm. but you know our, I mean just who we are is not is not just our body, like not mm -hmm. at all. And I think first of all that's a disorder. Like my opinion, mm -hmm. the idea that somebody goes well, my I'm only valuable to society if I look, whatever, right, right. pretty rich right. and thin, right. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, let me stop on that because that's kind of a, a that, that's somewhat of a big claim because I, I think our society does say that that they go, you if you're obese you're not worth anything if you aren't mm -hmm. blonde you know you mm -hmm. aren't worth anything, um, yeah. you know yeah so so let me stop yeah. there. What what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think it is so important for me to acknowledge my own privileges as a, a cis white straight sized provider sure. that counsels people in this. Um, and it is important for us to, to learn from, you know, the voices of people who exist in different body shapes and sizes. And, um, yes. I really have tried to make it a priority in my own practice and my own education to make sure that I'm learning from people with lived experience and, also practice self-compassion in the sense that I still have struggled with my own body image. I still have been told by my own doctor that I need to lose weight. I still have had my own more mild yet deeply personal experiences with weight-based discrimination and, and you yeah. know, weight-based feedback from my mom and, and all of those things. And so I think it is important to acknowledge, you know, at the top of this, this section of the podcast that it's such a nuanced and like muddy conversation. And oh, also, yeah. also, um, weight stigma is just a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And, um, that sounds like such a simple way of saying it, like weight stigma is a huge problem period. And so many people don't acknowledge that in and of itself, right. um, how terrible right. it is that individuals in larger bodies are judged at morally based on their shape and size, oh, um, yes. and that individuals in larger bodies and that exists on a spectrum, right, really struggle in their day-to-day -day with weight stigma and the fact mm -hmm. that I live in the body that I live in and have experienced weight stigma from my medical provider is also something that needs to be like acknowledged. Like this is a, this is a problem. Um, and it really, really ruptures people's relationship with food and exercise because we see food and exercise as tools to free ourselves from weight stigma rather right. than as tools to nourish ourselves. Right. And, and right to they make us unhealthy ultimately as opposed to healthy. Yeah. yeah. Unhealthy, unhealthy in, in our heads, unhealthy psychologically. Yes. Right. Because I will, you know, it's interesting. I think that the, I mean, I'm going to go off on a transgender experience for, for a quick second mm -hmm. yeah. because much of what 
transition is. I mean, there, there's, you know, there's like, let's say going from, from man to woman, you know, you grow your hair out. Let's say you learn how to put on makeup if you haven't already. Um, you know, you start taking, um, hormone therapy, but I think the biggest transition, this is my opinion, like the biggest step in a gender transition is believing you are the person you are. Because society ends up telling you, well, no, look at you. You have this genetic, you have this genotype, which means you have to be, you know, something else, which what our society wants to tell you. And the biggest part of, of the transition is actually believing, believing it, I think is the point. And we, you know, at the very least, you know, much of my community, the people around me, I mean, you know, we focus on, we, we think, well, if I just grow my hair out, I'll be done. If I, you know, if my hormones end up growing me, you know, growing me a C cup, I'm done. And so if I'll get more hormone therapy and then I'll be done, you know, I'll get bottom surgery and then I'm done. But the, you're done the time when you go, no, I am a woman or I am, I am a, you know, a man. Or I think maybe the bigger point is, you know, not to end up quoting the Barbie movie after ditching on Barbie earlier to be able to say that I am enough. So I know you have so many other aspects. We've talked about nutrition, but like, how do you integrate yoga and Reiki, all of the other, um, you know, energetic or energy aspects of your work? How do you, because you mentioned right at the beginning an integration and I think we're saying the same thing. It's an integration of, of our, our spirit into, you know, our material life. How, how do you achieve that? How do you in particular, but then, you know, in general, <laughs> what does that take? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Mm. I think the, the yoga, the movement, the breath work, the Reiki piece of what I offer is what I believe is the true antidote to really healing your relationship with your body. And I love what you shared about, you know, your transition is done or your transition feels more complete once you decide that it's complete. Once you feel integrated within yourself, it's not coming from, you know, this piece of physicality, this piece of physicality, just like your body image is not healed by weight loss. It's not like, Mm -hmm. oh, the second I lose weight, then I'm going to feel better about my body. The second I lose weight, then it's and you know, every client I see that's had the experience of weight loss has shared the same sentiment that I thought when I lost this weight, it was going to be better. And then I kept going and going and going and it still wasn't better. And embodiment is what I believe heals body image. I actually think the term body image in and of itself is kind of problematic. And one of my teachers, Hillary, Hillary McBride always talks about how, why, why do we need to say body image? Cause that's very intellectual. Mm-hmm. Why don't we talk about embodiment? Like how do you have a sense of embodiment and feel like you can experience your body? Because your body is you, right? Like it, it is you and it's part of you. You are not a body. You cannot be reduced to the object of your body. You cannot be reduced yes. to a, a meat puppet. And your body is part of you. It's a tool that you use to experience the world, to experience your five senses, to experience all the things that make life worth living. And so we have to integrate ourselves back into our bodies. And I love using movement, energy healing, breath work to help people really get back in their bodies. Cause for me personally, that was like the key that unlocked true full recovery for me. I was eating well. I had a decent relationship with exercise, but I still didn't quite feel like I was good. I still felt like a little out of my body. And I, especially in later phases of my recovery, I felt like I was just like avoiding my body, like complete body avoidance. And I was like, this, this isn't good either. I think a lot of people go from body negativity to body avoidance rather than body negativity to body neutrality to body positivity. They go from just like, let me just avoid this. I don't want to look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. I don't want to think about buying. I I like, I did not want to think about buying clothes. I wore the same pants like every day for like two years. I, I didn't exercise that much for a little bit because it's like, I didn't even want to like look over to the class and like look in the mirror. Like I just wanted to just avoid my body for a while. Um, and that wasn't working. 
didn't feel good. Um, and so I used embodiment practices to really integrate myself back into my body and like befriend my body and like use it as a tool. Um, and then eventually able to see it as something beautiful and experience it as something beautiful, not because it, of my, what I look like compared to societal standards, but because of what I feel like and because of mm-hmm. how connected I feel to myself via my body. Yeah. You, you know, it struck me in, in that whole, which by the way, was amazing. I, that experience, hearing your experiences, rings so many bells to me. Thank you. Um, so thank you. I, I, all of this has been amazing. One of the things that I noticed you did not say, one of the words you did not use was acceptance. Because mm. that is one of the, like if you go to a psychologist, they go, you know, one of the things they want you to learn is how to accept Mm-hmm. yourself but what you said you you said that um you learned how to see your body as a as a friend and mm-hmm. that's it just sounds different to me do you yeah is it different yeah yeah i mean i think that probably acceptance can be viewed as a, an important piece of the continuum that i use to help my clients heal sure. i think though i may be stray from that word because I think sometimes my clients in particular view acceptance as throw your hands up in the air. You can't, you you can't do anything. Right. Right. And it's, that's not true. Right. Cause you can do something. I wouldn't be a nutritionist if I didn't think that changing your diet didn't make you feel better. I wouldn't be a fitness instructor if I didn't think that exercise didn't make you feel better. I wouldn't be a Reiki healer if I didn't think that doing some energy work didn't make you feel better. And so it's like, there are things we can do to create change. You it has to start with acceptance of where you are and where you're starting from. Acceptance is beautiful. Acceptance is part of um, grief. And another one of my teachers, Brianna Campos, who would be a great person to have on your podcast, um, always talks about viewing body image kind of like as a bit of a grieving process because sometimes you really do need to go through like anger at like this is how my body is and this is how society treats it sadness for that a little bit of bargaining like ooh, should i diet should i not diet should i have my eating disorder should i let go of it and eventually arriving at acceptance but i think acceptance is like step one to creating change acceptance is not we accept and we just we chill um it's like we actually can do something and i i don't say that to promote like a coaching mentality of like hey you got to do something it's you can do something and you can feel new and different and better and you can take empowered compassionate Mm -hmm. action yeah it's i had been thinking of the word acceptance see i keep learning new stuff too i keep thinking or i've been thinking of the word acceptance as like this is a good thing you know, you go, hey, yeah. I'm accepting things. But it struck me as you were as you were talking, like when you when you meet when you match the social expectations, you don't need to accept that. Yeah. I mean, people. Yeah. Let me rephrase that. People would think you don't need to. That's untrue because you could be totally mm-hmm. rich, totally pretty, totally thin, and absolutely, you know, despise yourself. Mm-hmm. And so acceptance has this, has this, uh, I think has, the, has a connotation of th- that you're accepting, you're accepting the bad parts, you know, and I'm going to put that mm-hmm. in air quotes yeah. too, that you have to accept the bad parts, that, that there are parts of you that you're not going to fix, like you said, mm-hmm. and not only are you not going to fix them, you should be ashamed of them. They are bad in some way. And yeah. I, so now I actually appreciate that you never used the word accept because, because mm. yeah, the, the ability not to see anything as pathological mm-hmm. is probably, is probably good. It's, it's a tool. It's something you just work with. Um, mm-hmm. So there, there was something that I wrote in an article. I mean, I th- this was the first like maybe month or so that I was writing. So it was probably like October of last year. Mm-hmm. It's been a little more than a year, I think. And one of the things that I, that I wrote in this article was to say, um, that I know I will, I know I will be 
um, that I know I will have affected a successful gender transition when mm. I can look in the mirror and see enough of myself to accept the rest of myself. Mm. And I thought that was very profound to like, mm. you know, I wrote that and I thought, dang, you are really, you mm. know, look at you. Mm. But after speaking to you now, I think that my, um, I think that my thought has been, has been more disjointed than I think, you know, the, uh, mm. The seeing every seeing your body as a tool and as a framework, you know, for yourself, yeah. I think is is very powerful. Um, mm. So I certainly want to thank you for that. Um, mm. I am going to, to we will link your website, Full Soul Nutrition, as well as your podcast in the show notes. You mentioned Instagram. Do you want to do you want to say you know yeah. how how people can find you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I really need to streamline this stuff a little bit more because my private practice is called full soul nutrition. So my website is full soul nutrition.com. My podcast is called whole full and alive. So that's how you can find it. And then my Instagram is my name. <laughs> Instagram is katie.c.rd. Um, and that is a place where I love connecting with people. Um, I love connecting with new clients on Instagram. I also love connecting with people who just listen to the pod and people who might have heard this episode and had something inspired in them. I would love to talk to you. Like I'm very available and accessible on Instagram, so please reach out to me there. Um, that's that's the primary place where you can where you can find me. Cool. You you are so yeah. open and so intelligent thank you so much katie for for you know talking with me i learned a ton and i just appreciate everything you're thank doing you so this, much, it's so Emmy. good so thank All you right. so much i i look forward to continuing to collaborate with you oh my gosh i hope so because because yeah. i don't because now i don't want to stop so <laughs> good stuff i'm glad we were able to talk today right all right katie thank you thank you